The Craig Folly Show on Deadline Detroit is made possible in part by Lynette's Shrimp House, located in Highland Park. It's Metro Detroit's premier destination, serving juicy fried shrimp, fish, and wings, alongside soul food sides and new additions to the menu, like turkey tacos and desserts. Located at 13548 Woodward in Highland Park, just north of the Davidson, Lynette's is open for takeaway, noon to 8, Tuesday and Thursday, noon to 10 p.m. Friday and Saturday, and noon to 5 p.m. on Sunday. Call now, get some Lynette's. Well, hello, everybody, and uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the inaugural meeting of Growth Point Antifa. <laughs> we to be planning to subvert democracy in our own way here in Growth Point. So uh, well, get your socks out because it's a little chilly out there. You know, I know that's against your rules about wearing socks with loafers, but come on. Well. We got to represent. Actually, I kid, of course. The fact that I'm talking about Growth Point Antifa tells you how stupid of a week that was. This is the week that was on Deadline Detroit. I'm your host, Craig Folly, a.k.a. Biff, today. And I would like to welcome my co-hosts in here. We have Muffy, Nancy Derringer. Pink and green today. block here. Pink and green block. <laughs> with oh. pearls, I might notice. You've got your mm-hmm. pearls for clutching. Yep, You're all absolutely. set to go with that. Uh, uh-huh. Nancy Derringer, of course, a contributor to Deadline Detroit. Alan Lengel, who is the co-founder and editor of Deadline Detroit, is here today. He will be officially known as Chip. <laughs> Jeff is here today. And then, of course, we have two gentlemen uh, that uh, are joining us again. Todd Russell Perkins, of course. Todd Perkins is a regular guest on this program. Wonderful attorney, homeowner in Gross Point Shores, as a matter of fact. I love that sign behind you, sir. I'm sure it's ticking off the neighbors something fierce. <laughs> We're doing our part. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And also, longtime journalist and Deadline Detroit contributor Daryl Dossie is back with us once again, of course, repping Wayne State University. Thank you for being here as well. All right. So it's great to have everybody here. And and I want to say that this has been a very, very bizarre week and we're watching really, really strange things happen. And the thing is, I thought the worst thing that happened in the week was probably uh, those couple of hours where we thought that the Wayne County Board of Canvassers wasn't going to certify the election. But things have gone from bad to worse in this regard and that we now have the two leaders in the Michigan legislature as we speak meeting in the White House with Donald Trump. And what could that meeting possibly be about? I, I'm sure it's about infrastructure week or Great Lakes restoration funding. I'm sure that's what it's about. That's why he called those guys to the office. No, it's not. It's about Donald Trump potentially trying to find out what, if anything, these guys might be willing to do to help him in his fantasy quest to overturn this election. Now, I, you know, I know that there's no chance that this is going to happen. I firmly believe there's no chance this is going to happen. I want to believe there's no chance this is going to happen. Nancy looks like she's saying, don't buy it. I would no, I would not buy it. I mean, I don't put anything past the Michigan legislature these days. I mean, these guys have happily for years subverted the will of the people. And I don't see why. I mean, and as, as far as the greater Republican Party, you know, nationwide, it's like they stole a Supreme Court seat. Why wouldn't they steal an election? You know, this is, you know, they've already got, I mean, they've been doing this. Uh, what did Steve Bannon go say? We're going to like uh, get you into the rated E for explicit language uh, thing here. But um, flood the zone with shit. That's what they have done. They have flooded the zone with shit. And now they have undermined uh, faith in a truly a cornerstone of democracy, which is our electoral system. Our electoral I, system. You know, but go ahead, Todd. But here's the thing, though. Uh, uh, are we surprised? I mean, no. we are a country that's founded by thieves. Okay. We stole this from the indigenous Americans. We, we didn't want to pay taxes to Great Britain. You know, we're a bunch of criminals that <laughs> kind of like the people from Australia who were sent off and, and, and you know, cast aside by Great Britain. You know, if we want to talk about the core of it. We never stopped. We stole the lives of black people. We continue to do that. We continue to do it and obfuscate and subvert people in these very tactful ways, like you use that word tactfully, you know, or or tactically um, throughout the years. And it's just become more sedate, you know, and they're rocking people to sleep, you know, you know, in the street, when they talk about rocking people to sleep, it's like this, you know what I mean? So, but, you know, that's what they're doing to democracy. And, you know, it's a shame, you know, I don't put this past, you know, you still got to realize you got 70 something million people who are following Donald Trump. And, you know, are we talking about a civil war here? I mean, are we talking about, you know, because Biden, I believe, will be president. He will be seated as president. But what kind of seat will it be? You know, these rumblings and are anything what's going to happen and things like that. So 
you know, I'm very concerned. I mean, it's, you know, but at the same time, I'm not surprised by anything they do. You know what I'm saying? Anything these people do. And, it, you know, and I don't know, it's just, um, I, uh, you know, a lot of people want to have this shock and awe. They've been doing it for years. You he know, speaks so, the truth, but, you know. He's you right. Know, you know. He's absolutely right. I mean, you know, and, and, and I mean, to the point he was making earlier, I mean, 70 million people, 71 million people still voted for this man. 71 million people. Shocking. They're okay with fascism. They're okay with totalitarianism. They're okay with xenophobia. They're okay with racism. They're okay with homophobia. They're okay with, with, sex, with sexism and misogyny. So, I mean, you know, this is, this, you know, th this election, um, I don't think, that, you know, people say, well, this is the most election, important election of our lifetime. Well, actually, I, I tend to think 2016 was, but, and we blew that one. Yeah. Um, so there's a whole lot of cleaning up that we have to do around. But I think that, um, you know, I, I, I'm not particularly worried about Donald Trump, per se. I mean, these are the antics of a clown who's on his way out of here. I mean, there's simply no way that the Supreme Court, there's no way that any of the bedrock institutions of this country are going to overturn this election. I mean, there's far more on the line than just Donald Trump's ego. Um, I think a lot of this, to be quite frank with you, and, you know, I'm a watcher of 24-hour cable news. I mean, I'm a journalist. But I think a lot of this is fodder to kind of fill some of the airways. I mean, we should keep an eye on what's going on. I mean, definitely it's disturbing. Don't get me wrong. But I, I just, you know, this whole thing with Michigan even, you know, they, there's no way they're going to uncertify, um, you know, the, uncertify the votes, the election. And, and, I mean, you know, if we move into that, see, this is the thing. Like, I'm always the sort of person because, you know, I'm, I'm from the I'm from the east side of the church. So the whole thing really was when I was growing up. Well, if somebody does something to you, what are you going to do? You know what I mean? So when we say black lives matter to me, that's not a you know, that's not a state. That's a property. I'm letting you know that if you do this, then that's going to happen to you because black lives matter. Well, I think I think I don't think there's any way they get away with this in the normal channels. Otherwise, we have to take it to extra career. You will see mass protests. You will see people in the streets. This country will explode. I just don't think they want that. I, I Go ahead, Alan. One of the, one of the gauges is, is Fox News. And when you see the, after Rudy Giuliani, who had whatever was dripping. Oh, we'll, we'll talk uh, about that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, <laughs> the elite, the elite strike force. Like, that's an L like. But the fact <laughs> is that the Fox, the Fox News reporter was calling him out. On, on lies and stuff like that. I think once you lose Fox, I think you've lost your battle. I think you've lost, it's the final sign that no, there's people who actually do care even at Fox about democracy but, and this has gone way too far. But Alan, I mean, you know, one of the things that I am seeing are people that I've known for a long time, that I've known to be relatively intelligent people, good education, went to college even, did all the sorts of stuff, who are willing to believe that there is this vast conspiracy uh, to rig these machines, talking about these machines got sent to Germany, which is baloney, um, somehow suggesting that Hugo Chavez, who's been dead for seven years, is involved in overturning this election and actively pushing this out there on social media to their friends. And then, you know, as soon as you challenge him on it, just saying, well, you don't know what you're talking about. This is deep. Now, you know how many people would have to be involved in this to pull off something like this? The fact that smart people are believing really, really stupid stuff is I, something I, that I, 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 I'm really concerned people. about. I, I think that Chavez is responsible for the fly on Mike Pence's head. <laughs> I, I'm convinced of that. No, but you, Craig, you said smart people. What does that mean? Is that a person who knows how to read a book and knows yeah, how to They, got some, they got some book learning. Yeah, you know, and, and, but does that apply to the social interaction and, and those things? Because here's what you have. You have a lot of people who have been standing by the side and not saying anything over the past, you know, 50, 60, 70 years. Most people don't say anything. And so when this surge happens, then they, they're going to follow the trend. They're going to follow what's easy for them. They're going to follow what they know. So, you know, that's what's happened. And so just because they know how to take a test, they went to college and they have these degrees does not make them smart from a global perspective. So I, I think a lot of it is willful I, 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 ignorance, though. Really quickly about Trump supporters, let's quit acting like there is some built-in, you know, some real reason, some real rationale. This is not a policy-driven uh, movement. This is not, these people wave flags from their pickup trucks and, you know, you know, 
Right. This is not. There is nothing about this that is tethered to reality or to the real understanding of the political landscape. This is an emotional outburst. This is a white supremacist last gasp. You know, people who are seeing themselves democrat uh, dem- demographically being you know uh, 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 reduced in terms of numbers. They don't want to share. I mean, the bottom line, this is the temper tantrum of a bunch of spoiled children who've never had the chair, who are now being forced to have to share a little bit of something in this country. And and not even that much. I mean, too. And it's not like, you know, these people are acting as if somehow, you know, they've got this fortune in their nice houses and wherever they live. And somehow this is going to be taken away. They're going to be thrown out of their houses. You know, this is not going to happen. Um, And. It just it. But it shocks me that they are willing to believe this and unwilling to see just the racism at the core of the arguments that they're trying to make. Well, because because we're in a racist society. This is a racist society. You cannot deal with it from racial interaction like we talk about Charlottesville. That's clearly a racial act of violence that was premised on the racist society. Society. I, I tell people this all the time. Everyone white has benefited from racism, period. You know, you cannot deny that from a social perspective. And until we stand up and say, I'm not gonna tolerate that as a union, you know, because over, my son had a project about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and it was about indentured servitude, about 1400. And there was an uprising with, there were black indentured servants and there were white indentured servants. And so what they did was they started to enslave the blacks and they told the white people, you can buy your freedom. And even though they were poor and destitute, they told them, hey, at least you're white. That's the same thing Donald Trump is telling them right now. They have nothing. They have their, their, you know, he could care less about them, but he can use their momentum, their anger and their hate about their plight and their situation and blame it on black people. In the 50s, when black scabs took white jobs, that's forever emblazoned in those white people's minds that this black person took my job, not the corporation that was trying to negotiate better because they were trying to start a union. During the, so they during constantly, the, the top is constantly pitted the lower than the this only way this works is a is a is a revolution of the proletariat and That's black and white and everyone. That's it. Wow. Go ahead, Alan. <laughs> during the campaign, when he was saying, We're gonna I'm gonna protect the suburbs. And if it weren't for me, we're gonna make sure, you know, there'd be high crime, your property values would be going down. It was like, oh my gosh. I mean Orville Just, Hubbard is president. Yeah. <laughs> I, oh, my gosh. And the fact that he hasn't been called on. I mean, this president has it, gotten away with more stuff than any, any other president. There are no standards anymore. I mean, it really it really has when I think we just took it as a joke when he said I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and get away with it. But it proved to be true. And nobody I, has. It's not a dog whistle. I'm not out there going, here, boy, here, boy. This guy has valued the, 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 the truth. I mean, he's taken the currency of truth and made it almost worthless to his followers. It means truth is nothing to him anymore. The whole, the whole thing. Go ahead, this whole thing is about somebody. Somebody described this as the as in Jurassic Park. This is the the phase where the raptors are testing the the, the strength of the of the of the chain link fence. You know, I mean, that's what we're seeing. I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't mean when I say he's not going to get away with it. It doesn't mean that there's not a, a larger play afoot. And I think that there really is an ongoing effort to diminish and to degrade to undermine democracy. In this country, I mean, but I don't think it started with Donald Trump. I don't think it ends with Donald Trump. Donald Trump was when Donald Trump was saying that you know Barack Obama wasn't born in the United States. The fact that you know the first black president in this country had to produce his birth certificate in order to quell that in people. I mean, that was humiliating. That was that should have been humiliating for the country. You know, it wasn't humiliating, but it should have been humiliating for the country. And and we continue to allow these things into popular discourse. There are things that we talk about in this country. We were talking on, on the nightly news about whether Barack Obama was actually a citizen of the I mean that got traction in this country. Let me tell you something. There's a there's a there there are segments of of beliefs in, 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 in the black community where we believe that white people were grafted from pigs and the devil. You know, these things don't make it into popular currency, though. We don't have round tables about this kind of stuff because we dismiss it out of hand because we know it's nonsense. You know what I mean? I can show you black sex, black movements where people pull all kinds of crap out of their behind. 
But black, but this is the function of white privilege. Black people don't have the power to make these things a part of the national discourse. Our nonsense is just that. It's our nonsense and it stays in the churches or some of these quasi-cryptic cult types of places or whatever. And you know about it, you may laugh about it, but you never take it seriously. This is a country where we can actually have a reasonable quote unquote conversation about whether black people are as intelligent as white people. Well, we can have you know, a conversation about the bell curve. We can have a conversation about the humanity of black men. I remember when I worked at the Detroit News, there was a particular editorial writer whose name I'm not going to say, but he was black. <laughs> and I sat in a room one time and I, I listened to this man have a conversation with his, with, his white, with his white peers and supervisors about whether there was a crime gene in black men. Okay, and we're only talking, I'm only talking about what I've seen transpire in my adult professional life. You know, we're not talking about with my uncles, my grandfathers, my grand. This is a part of an ongoing narrative that makes this conversation, quote unquote, reasonable to people. We well, shouldn't even be having some of this kind of crazy. But let's 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 continue this, though, based on something that happened this week. The Wayne State Board of Canvassers, that original meeting where they were to certify the vote. Wayne County. In Wayne County. And, and so you had a situation where, you know, uh, of course, the two Republicans decided that they weren't going to certify the vote, leaving it deadlocked, which would have then just kicked it up to the state, would have cost uh, Wayne County a bunch of money because they would have been on the hook for that. But the thing was, it, and it was laid bare, and a lot of people don't want to see that this is the reality, but it was laid bare what they were trying to do when Monica Palmer said, well, I'm willing to certify all the votes except the city of Detroit. None of the white communities that supported Joe Biden were going to get that same sort of treatment. Livonia had a worse record than Detroit did percentage wise in terms of those ballots that don't balance, which is like we're talking like 35 votes. I mean, it's not. Votes. Yeah, it, well, exactly. And it was ridiculous. And that laid it bare. And then, of course, it was opened up to public comment where our friend Ned Stabler was made temporarily famous this week uh, by going on his great rant saying, hey, look, this is racist. And the stain of racism is going to stick with you for the rest of your days. And he wasn't wrong. But the thing is, so many of these people on the right are saying, oh, these are the kinds of vicious attacks that we're going to have to face. And it's not fair. The lefties are so dangerous. And I'm saying, no, if you're a racist and you get called out for your racism, that's just what goes with the territory. You cannot yeah. just be a racist and expect people just to sit there and go, oh, that's just the way they are. Bullshit. Suck it up. Take it. If you're going to be a public racist, expect public criticism and expect it to be harsh and expect yourself to be judged harshly. There was nothing wrong with what Ned said. It was not threatening. It was factual. You are a racist. This is a racist action. It will be remembered as such. And I think it was laid bare. And the fact that so many people are, are like now cowering in the corner saying, oh, don't dox me. Screw you. <laughs> no, but here's the thing. You know, in, in segueing on to that. You know, you said, you know, those people are just dog shit. I said that on my Facebook post and I said that before. And, you know, the thing is, it's the same way that. OK, so what happens from that? They want to now change the narrative because they control the streams of media. But for the Craig Folly show, you know, and, and the things like that. And there are podcasts. And the beautiful thing about the Internet is it has given people a platform, but it's also given the nuts a platform, too. But at the same time, who controls the major streams and networks and who's going to continue to bring that to the forefront? Because I always tell people, you know, this is something that, again, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. And thank God for the people who were there. And, you know, thank God for the people who rallied from the National Lawyers Guild, who, who spoke against it, uh, Stabler and, you know, the uh, representative from Hamtramck. Now he's got backlash because of what he said. Are you ridiculous? But well, you know again. What? This is, this is the end would... of America as we know it. If we never deal with race honestly, we've never done it. You know, and, and that's just, you know, like we said, we're testing the waters, but we're testing it both ways. Are we going to deal with race honestly? And, you know, and I'm not necessarily making a pitch for reparations, but I, it is strange why every other ethnicity and race has received reparations for the, the atrocities of, of the uh, majority culture and African-Americans have not. But again, it's always been about it. It's never going to stop being about it. They've made it the dynamic in Western culture. And, and, you know, I just feel like my mom used to tell me when I was a kid, same thing. She's been telling me this. And she's like, I got a high school diploma. She says, but I can get a job before any of my sons who have all gone to college. That's oh. just the way the society is. And that showed itself 
and Monica Palmer. What, what is she doing out here in, in Bros Point with that dark money trying to push these candidates on the school board? Yeah, you, you, you know, you, you touch on things, Craig, and you get into the right into the meat of it, and you know, and you just let us go ham. And I, I, I just appreciate well, that, you know, it, there's, there's no point in us sitting here not telling the truth about what's going on and what we're witnessing. I mean, it doesn't, you know, I, it, like I said, you talk about reparations. I mean, hey, I think the United States could use a Truth and Reconciliation Commission like they had in South Africa at the end of apartheid. It's something that would help us come to grips with just how much damage we have done. And this, I don't need right their now, money. I just need doing- fairness. This, I, I want this is doing damage though, right? Yeah, now. I want what money. we're going through now want, is doing I want, damage. I want your money. I want your money. <laughs> I want your money. The, the, the racial wealth gap in this country is the most damning testament to the history of racism and slavery in America. And, you know, just to Stokely Carmichael's point, you know, if you want to have a war on poverty, you don't want people to be poor anymore. Simple. Give them money. And, oh, and, 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 and this is not something, this is something I'm old. My family's nine generations deep in this bad. We fought in every war in this that this country has ever had. My, my my people came over here on a boat too. You know, so when we talk and these are the things that should be normalized, you know what I mean? To to Todd's point. I mean, this is a conversation that we all should be having. You know, we're all part and parcel of this. I'm you know, and I think a truth and reconciliation commission, I would suggest that, you know, first folks first learn to be able to digest the sixteen nineteen project. Something as simple, you know, something as straightforward as something like that. But I think that yes, this is the way that we begin to have conversations. Plucking Detroit out of all of the votes in the state, I mean, that's, you know, that's obviously abnormal. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that we've gotten to the point where we can have conversations like this in this kind of platform, because this, you know, for a very, very long time, you know, it's felt like when, you, when, you, when you're black in this country, you know, you're the only person who understands just how ghoulish, how crazy some of this seems. You know what I mean? We would tell people about how the police would treat us and nobody believed it until they saw it happen to Rodney King, until we got it on video. We, so, so, I mean, I'm saying that there is a long, we've got a long way to go in terms of the conversation that we need to be having in this country because we've accepted that things like that are somehow normal. Well, you know what? Oh, okay, Alan, then I, we got to move on. It, Go ahead. It, it's interesting. You talk about wealth disparity and stuff like that. We see the scene the other day of miles and miles down in Dallas, uh, the Dallas area, where people are lined up for, for food. food to get free food. At the same time, the stock market is doing great. And so what, is, you know, what does that tell you about this country, that when people are starving, the business people are happy? It's good to be rich. Things are well. And the other thing I was going to say real quick is that, you know, like Rudy Giuliani is just one of the people who who keeps talking about, you know, the people have filled out affidavits, sworn affidavits, their perjury and stuff like that. It's like I don't doubt that a lot of the people who fill that out are sincere about it, but it's their perceptions. They saw something or they thought they saw something. They heard something. They something. They They heard heard something something from from something. They're dangling. Totally false. And, you know, it's like we saw ballots being run through a second time. Well, yeah, they didn't go through right the first time. They never were recorded. They saw the trucks pull up with the food trucks. Well, you know, it's all BS. It's like somebody. You know what? But- the Republicans weren't allowed in there. There were more Republicans in there. So what was happening? There were too many. People we, in we know all of this. Wow. I mean, you know, it's like the, we keep we keep trying to litigate this thing over and over again. And I mean, at some point, we have to stop letting these people dominate the narrative. And we instead of just saying, I'd like to listen respectfully to you because that oh, yeah. is part of my values. We have to say you are simply full of shit and you need to shut up and sit down. I mean, the if you want to if you want to learn something, I mean, I hate to be an evangelist on this. If all of those people who are so concerned about elections in in Detroit are you know want to do something about it then then call the board of elections take the training and work a precinct i've done it twice now and i've learned more about how michigan elections are run than i ever knew as a journalist and i'm here to tell you it's fine right, but, okay you so let me right, tell you go ahead don't, you don't come to detroit you don't come to detroit and think you're going to have a brooks brothers right you know what I'm saying? That's what cracked me up. I was like, they really thought they were going to pull that off? <laughs> you know, I mean, they started bringing out those big brothers that went to Kettering and like, you know, the gang squad. You know, I'm just like, I don't know what makes you think this is going to work in this city. <laughs> and that's the other thing. Well, dear, I just want to say that scene at the TCF Center the day after the election, when the absentee counting was still going on, was one of the most deeply racist things 
that I have have seen with my own eyes because what you had in the center sitting at those tables was Charlie LaDuff and about, you know, a few hundred middle-aged black women. Okay. There were some men in there. Sure. There were some of them, a lot of, some were white, but I mean, the, the board of elections, the people who wear the black pants and the white shirt on election day and do their job are disproportionately black women. And to have them in there trying to concentrate and trying to like, you know, concentrate on a job, which involved, you know, taking ballots out of the, out of the envelope, smoothing them out, getting them ready for the tabulator. And to have these Karens out there screaming at them, pounding on the windows, like crazy people. It was, un- I mean, it was, I don't understand why they didn't die of shame on the spot. Well, well, okay. So, so this is the foundation of all these quote unquote affidavits and by yeah, the way, yeah. they're dangling cash out to people to come up with stories. And there's a whole lot of people I know would sign an affidavit if they think they're going to get paid, even right. if they didn't see anything, but we basically know that the foundation of all these arguments about a stolen election are just what Nancy called it. Bullshit. They are <laughs> bullshit. There is no proof. Um, but the fact that Mike, uh, that, that Shirky and Chatfield took the meeting with the president today in Washington and are again, meeting right now, there's nothing good that can come from that meeting today this seems to me to be something that is just fraught with all kinds of danger if they even entertain a question from the president about whether or not there's something they can do to change the will of the voters seems to be something that could get them in a lot of legal trouble now todd i'm not an attorney but it seems to me that there are some pretty open cases of election interference we're seeing from people like lindsey graham calling the guy in georgia the president trump calling the board of canvassers to offer them support or calling this meeting with shirky and chatfield today i I just i see legal danger if i was their attorney i would have told them no way do you take that meeting well, uh, you know, the thing is, you would also have to have a source as to what they said during the course of the meeting. Which so we should like, have. Just like Nancy said earlier, she says they heard certain things, you know, and things like that with those affidavits. Now, those people who signed affidavits that heard things that are testifying in those affidavits or, or swearing to in those affidavits that they actually saw with their own eyes, if that's how the affidavit read, I've not read any of them, then that's a lie. So that's a crime. But do you think that they're going to actually talk about what, you know, well, we don't know what they'll do knowing Trump is involved. But, do you know, I don't think that we're going to know the content of what it is. But I think more to Daryl's point, this is part of a larger momentum. Donald Trump is a clown. He's a reprobate and a criminal. And he's probably going to go to jail in New York. If New York does what they're supposed to do, that's how you cut off the king's head. But oh. he's creating a momentum. And all those people, the, the, the smarter people behind him, the truly you know, insidious people behind him, not that he's not truly insidious, behind him are creating this larger momentum. And I'm, you know, just thinking about, yeah, Biden and and Kamala Harris will be uh, president and vice president. But if you've got this surge and this underbelly that's rising and continues to be stoked at a fire and they continue to live on even after the king is gone, you think about it, this guy's 74, 75 years old, how much more time does he have? But, you know, evil people, they kind of live a long time anyway. Oh, so, well, that, you know. then let's, let's talk about one of them, because we always knew that Rudy Giuliani was a slimy individual. Oh, but he God. was literally slimy yesterday. Oh, <laughs> yeah. One oh, of the God. grossest things I've ever watched was that press conference yesterday. One, because of the content, which was just, I mean, this was off the charts batshit. Uh, and then, of course, there was also the uh, hair dye. Uh-huh. Leaking down the side of his face and there was the moment where he blew his nose and then like touched it and then put it up to his face and was wiping <laughs> his face with snot i mean it's like what are you doing i mean he he looked like he looks like the bad guy in underdog cartoons i don't know if anybody remembers that show but he does <laughs> But I mean, bar sinister. I mean, yeah, that thank you. <laughs> That's exactly right, Daryl. I appreciate that. And and I, I'll tell you what, I, I watched that yesterday. Fox was the only one that showed it. Everybody else cut away, but I had to watch it just because. Again, it's like a train wreck. This was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Um, and Rudy Giuliani is just disintegrating in front of our very eyes over these last few weeks. Did you see the true service journalism piece that the New York Times did? Um, it, they posted it within a couple hours yesterday, where they actually called up hairstylists and said what would make that happen? And, you know, they pointed out, which is, I mean, I've had my, I mean, I've stopped coloring my hair, but I used to. And, you know, depending on what you use occasionally, if I would work out real hard, it would, I get a little tint on the collar of my t-shirt or something, but they were saying what 
caused that was probably he was using like mascara on his or some sort of mascara type product on his sideburns to take the gray out, which is pathetic. I mean, well, the one thing that me- right. I mean, you know, Rudy Giuliani is not a sex god by any stretch of the imagination. Well, even Borat proved that. Exactly. I but just he- watched it last night. <laughs> but I, I mean, I, I, I just don't have to worry girl. about this stuff. Go ahead. Sorry, Derek. I just thought the Jerry curl was dripping. That's all. I mean. <laughs> yeah, the, the soul glow was that's coming it, down. That's right. I was like, oh, this is Jerry curl. <laughs> you, know, you, you messed up those pillowcases. Right. You know, you know <laughs> no, but here's the thing. But you got to look at it. And this guy, this is the craziness about it. And this guy actually has a platform. People are listening to him. You know, that first, you know, on that Saturday when they declared uh, uh, Biden the victor, you know, people, you know, one of the story was telling me he was having this uh, uh, um, agenda um, with the tell news conference right outside a, a, a sex shop. You know, it was like yeah. between a hotel and a Four sex shop. Four Seasons. Four Seasons. Totally totally yeah. oh, Four Seasons. <laughs> I, got, right. I got the hat coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, you know, getting getting back to this, though, I mean. I don't know how anybody can look at this and think that there's uh, any legitimacy to any of it. And you're finally starting to see a couple of people like Mitt Romney and and Ben Sass um, uh, and uh, uh, Joni Ernst from from Iowa saying, hey, enough is enough. But that's three. I, I, I want to know what you guys think about the people who are enabling this charade to continue. I'll say one very brief thing and then I'll let you guys take over. The reason they are fighting so hard is because they see the door closing. I mean, one thing that Trump has done for these people is he has enabled and enriched con artists and grifters of all shapes, colors, sizes, and stripes. And they know it's over. And that is why they are fighting like, you know, like uh, Monica. And and he's delivered three Supreme Court seats, which. Yeah. I I hope it was worth it. For them. Right, exactly. And tax cuts. I mean, they got what they wanted out of them. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't, and I mean, just like somebody was saying earlier, like what comes next is, you know, somebody who has, you know, all of the political depravity, all of the immoralism, but who is smart, who is externally mature, who knows how not to act like a child. That's the person I'm afraid of. Yes. I'm saying that the person, the you're not going to see them coming until they've already started their agenda. Yeah. Well, they're kind of like the devil. The devil does, you know, the devil does not, not a Rudy Giuliani guy. He's a ghoul. You know, the devil is actually going to be somebody who's like Sean Connery type of guy. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, or, or Idris Elba. You know, I'm not saying those people, of course, but he's going to look good because, you know, you think about it from a spiritual perspective. How does the devil win? The things that he offers you have an immediate sense of gratification. Good looking, you know, uh, make you happy right away. Not the long chore of working this out over the long term, like you know, like Craig said, having a commission come in and and the hard work of doing all those things. No, the devil's gonna make it right, just like that, and he's gonna look good while doing it. Externally, be smart and all those other things. So you know, he, you know, so that's what it's gonna be. But by the time we recognize we got in bed with the devil. That's what I, I'm just like Daryl. I'm so scared of that individual, you know, and it's too late by the time they have it. So I don't think it, I don't think a little bit is the door is open right now and they're afraid of it closing. I do agree with that, but I'm afraid of the fact that the momentum is still continuing. Yes. This, so, you know, so what you're saying is that, that Rudy Giuliani's cap teeth and hair dye is not enough to make him into Idris no, Elba. No, <laughs> I'm not talking about the rules. You know what I'm saying? No, was, there's, Albert Brooks had a great speech about this in broadcast news, and he was talking about William Hurt's character, who was, was like the Dan Rather of the, yes. uh, you know, right. he was talking about a network, but he, he did. He said, when the devil comes, he's not going to have like horns and a pointy tail. He's going to be nice. He's, ne- you know, he's going to be kind. People are going to like him and then all of a sudden and then little by little he lowers our standards yeah you know? i mean D- donald trump was the devil's advance man so well I think, here's a- I, I think that i don't think that any of these people should be allowed to get away none of these rats should be allowed to skip off of the sinking ship you know somebody described donald trump as the sort of guy who would dress like a woman to get off of the titanic and <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, 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 and i think that's true and, and i think that there are a whole lot of people who are just like him i'm not buying this crap from Ben Sass. All of a sudden, you found your backbone. You know, if you had a backbone when this man was impeached, he'd have been out of here. We not have had to deal with this. I think that, you know, I'm like AOC. I'm making a list, 
and I'm checking it twice, and I think we need to be going after all of these people because all these people have proven themselves to be open enemies of democracy. You just, you just need the right person to come along and make them the right bargain, make them the right offer. And all they're of these people need it. They're well, how, long, how long does Joe Biden sort of play it cool like this in terms of, of not getting access to the resources he needs to make a smooth transition? Right now he's saying, look, this is going to pass. We'll let him have his tantrum. Uh, and then, of course, we'll, we'll get down to business here. But, you know, with, with COVID the way it is right now, we're going to talk a bit about that in a second. But how long should Joe Biden just keep playing it cool like this and trying to figure out, you know, just and say, at what, at what point does he push back a lot harder? I think now. I think, what he needs I, think he to has, do, I think we need this is a tantrum. We need to cut it off. He Go needs ahead. to invite some of the more reasonable Republican senators, and there aren't who many. are they? There aren't many, and but he needs to put together a coalition that just forces it through now, and not later, and not waiting for everyone to come around. And maybe it's maybe it's the certification which comes up and turns it around. But we shouldn't have to wait. I mean, this is such a farce. He needs he needs to be more forceful about it. Well, but the thing is about it is, you know, the, the other senators, those Republicans, they're cowards. They're running from the fact that he's got 70 million people in his pocket and all those other things. You know, my thing is, you, you know, I'm going after them like AOC. I, I, I go a little bit further back from that. I go back to Harriet Tubman. You know, I'm looking at the people that look like me who who, who don't feel like I do and, and, and represent that particular agenda. I'm killing them first. And, you know, you have to get to the point where New York is ready and, and ramping this up because, you know, you can't what the whole thing is. You can't indict a president. You know, I think a lot of this is posturing by his him also is the fact that he knows he's not going to be president. How can he posture himself and and, and hopefully, uh, you know, just like you saw in the news. Did you see that Mexican general? He was just dis- the case was dismissed out of, yeah. out of Brooklyn, New York. Yes. And he's a real big time criminal, apparently. I don't know. He's- and- I, I know something about that case. I mean, they're suddenly dismissing all. They they dismiss another case. Uh, but look at what they said. Case of all in China, that guy was that guy was involved with. He was a def- he's a minister, a defense minister, or something. He was yeah. involved with the cartels. I mean, you know, but they dismissed it for cooperation the between the reports. countries. And, and suddenly, they arrested the guy in in Los Angeles. They took him over to Brooklyn. They arraigned him. He was he was in prison pending trial. And the Mexican government says, oh, you caught us by surprise. Well, of course, the the U.S. isn't going to tip off the Mexican government that there's a guy in American soil we're about to arrest. Uh, and so we arrested him. And then suddenly, just out of nowhere, and the, you know, the interesting thing is the judges are shocked by what's going on. There's another case where the judge is like, wow, how did this come about? You're dropping the charges. It was involving a a, a Chinese national or something. It's the same. Something weird is going on. Well, where- those are the diplomatic relations that go on. And, and, you know, for the interests of cooperation amongst the government, those two governments, which I can understand that. But what he's also doing, what Donald Trump is single handedly trying to do is trying to create that whole momentum that he creates himself almost like a, his autonomous government that he represents a certain cadre of people enough and a strong enough force so that when he leaves office, maybe they'll leave him alone. Maybe they'll leave his family alone and different things like that. And I think that that's what he's also posturing about. So, you know, you have to look at it from that perspective. I think he's running running scared. He wants to pretend like he's not, but I think he's also a scared little child who's running and trying to create this whole momentum. And, and at the same time, you know, it's a smoke and mirrors. He's been doing that for Four years or he's been doing that for, you know, when did he start that Bertha thing? That Bertha thing led to him being president. It really yes. did. It did. You know? And, 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 and he's, doing what he's, always done. he's doing what he's always done, which is grift. Dude, you got to understand, this is also this whole resistance to the election. Oh, money. Recognize Biden's legitimacy it was stolen from me. Trump knows this is all a lie. This is why Giuliani is the spearhead of his elite legal strike team. Because he knows it's all a joke, but the thing is, you keep the rules up as long as you can because you got you still got some suckers out there who are going who are going to send you money, who are going to get on your bandwagon, who are going to do whatever they can do. You know, you had ten thousand people for the million maga, you know, the the million maga. Mar- I mean, I'm sure he's tapping every last one of those wallets. You know what I mean? And that's what Trump is really all about. Carol, 
and, and, and keep in mind too, I mean, you know, Mitch McConnell's not going to say a damn thing right now because he still needs these, this group of people engaged because he needs those Senate seats sure. in Georgia. He yeah. needs them badly. And, and uh, you know, so he needs that base energized. If he goes back and says Trump lost, then these people are going to lose interest in that election. They're going to lose interest in all of it. They're going to think it's all rigged and they're not going to show up to vote. And then Mitch McConnell's going to be out on his butt. So, um, you know, used to him anyway. I'm telling you, man, Trump, Trump is worried about prison and bills right about now. You know, and, <laughs> and, 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 and all the, you know, he doesn't care about the coronavirus. You know, we saw what was almost uh, 190 some odd thousand cases or whatever in one day. I mean, you know, he's, he's skyrocketing through the roof. And, you know, he's just mad because Pfizer came out with the vaccine a week after the election. Okay. Shout out to Pfizer. Start, that's a, that's, a, that's a hint towards my schmuck of the week a little bit later on. I've got a good one for that. Uh, okay. and you well, just jogged my memory. Thank you. But we do need to talk COVID for just a second because we are seeing uh, a really, really bad spike. As you mentioned, 186,000 cases, I believe, yesterday. Um, and uh, it, it's awful in a lot of places. And what you're seeing, of course, is a number of states doing exactly what Michigan did in terms of locking things down. Utah, you know, you've got Iowa that is doing this, Wisconsin looking at some new measures and, and a bunch of states doing exactly what our governor did, Governor Whitmer, months ago. And I don't see a whole lot of people talking about, you know, trying to impeach their governors over doing this. Their hospitals are overwhelmed. They're hearing from them. They don't have the capacity in these rural hospitals at all. They're getting pummeled. And so now we're finally starting to see uh, much of America realizing what we knew here in Detroit a long time ago, that this crap is very, very serious. And I hate to say that, you know, it's a reckoning, but it certainly feels like it at the moment for these anti-maskers and all these people out there that have been in denial. All these governors that have been in denial that there's a problem are getting hit hard now. And now here they are screaming for some sort of resources from the federal government. And the federal government is AWOL on this. Senator again. Jared Kushner. He's like, you know, he's, he can fix everything. Yeah. It's like, it's, did you watch uh, Totally Under Control? The uh, I did the, not. The d documentary about the, the coronavirus. It's very oh. good. I think it's, it's the director has made it available on a lot of free and and pretty much every streaming service has has it. And you can probably find it on YouTube and, you know, whatever. It's really good. And it talks about like how bungled the response was, how bungled it remains um, why the cases continue to skyrocket. And it all goes back to Donald Trump didn't want to have to deal with it in an election year. And so he tried to punt to the states. And so you ended up with states like South Dakota, you know, freedom, freedom. And, and you know, they, and now look where they are and along with North Dakota. And then you had states like Michigan, you know, where the governor kind of took it seriously. And she ended up in a, a freaking kidnapping well, and, and and of course, we do now have it got shot down on arrival, but somebody actually did try to introduce an article of impeachment for Governor Whitmer. Uh, what's his name? Um, he's up in the UP, Paul up in Lefebvre. Iron Mountain. Paul Lefebvre. Thank you. Paul Lefebvre. To walk into the, you know, the state of the state address with his machine pistol, you know, yeah, it ended yeah. up getting stolen because he's, he's, he's a guy. Of, yeah, exactly. represent UP. You know, I used yeah. to think that you were the cool part of the state. You know, where have you gone, Dominic Jacob Eddy? Come on you now. Know, you know what would be interesting is if the insurance companies told people, we're not going to pay for your COVID treatment if you weren't wearing a mask. In the same way that car companies say, we're not paying for your car. You didn't lock it and someone broke in. Sorry. Um, I mean, I don't know what incentive it's going to take for, for some of these people to comply, but we're, we're all paying for their, their ignorance. Yeah. So we're paying for Trump. Trump setting the setting the table for these people to think the whole thing is a farce. It's you know you still have there on the TV news the other night there was like some doc, some nurse or doctor talking about one of the patients who was dying who was saying no I, this can't be Corona it's got to yeah. be something else. <laughs> it's like it, what, what difference does it make? You're dying. I mean you know it's just like but it's not COVID. It's not COVID. Maybe I just got instant cancer. I mean what's this guy thinking? I, I don't understand this but you know I I just. I'm frustrated because Thanksgiving is coming up this week, obviously, and and we're not traveling to see anybody this time around. It's going to be a very small little group here. Uh, I can't see my mother who's in a nursing home. They just went back down on lockdown. Uh, and I've already lost five good months with my mother who's got some some, uh, you know, some problems that she's got as a senior. And I lost some time when it could have been more effective communication than than we're going to have going forward. And I'm upset about this. 
And I think there's a whole lot of people that are upset about this. But I'll tell you what, if you want to be over sooner, follow the guidelines. Practice social distancing. Wear a damn mask. I still have the sign in the back. I haven't changed it for six months. It says wear a damn mask up there. And that's what we need to do. But, I mean, you still have this resistance in these people that are in denial about what is going on. And I'm trying to wrap my head around it. Uh, The one positive I did see is that the number of people who said they would take the vaccine, the percentage of people saying they'd be willing to do it was below 50% a few months ago. It has climbed over 50% for the first time. So I think maybe the message is getting through. Yes, maybe. I hope so. And I mean, I would have been in that, I would have been on the bubble a few months ago. Um, and I think I said at the time, if a vaccine is endorsed by Angela Merkel, uh, I will probably take it. If it's something that uh, Donald Trump has pulled out of his enormous Scott ass. At- uh, Scott Atlas. Yeah. Exactly. Or Scott Atlas. Yeah. Hydroxychloroquine. You know, I mean, they're, just, they're still on this, right? Fauci's a pretty reliable uh, source. Fauci's all right. I can, yeah. And, and wow. I'm a little Deborah Burks. So. All right. Well, we, we do have to move on to Schmuck of the Week because we've been going for quite a while here. And I want to thank yeah, everybody for, for helping us out. But um, I've got a good nominee today and it's one I haven't been able to use in a while. So I'm pretty excited about it. Now, remember, this is the Donald J. Trump. The J stands for genius schmuck of the week award. It can't be Donald Trump because we named the trophy after him. He just does so many things each and every week that would earn him the award that we needed to make sure that some of the sunlight got to shine on some other people every week. So without further ado, our schmuck of the week nominees, who wants to go first today? Um, Alan Langle wants to go first. I will say, cause I only want to go first because it, it may be of others as well, but Dr. Atlas, I think, not, not oh, only is it such a farce that he is in the position <laughs> he's in, but the fact that he was trying to stir up uh, trouble here in Michigan, trying to get people to rebel. Rise up. Yeah. Like, it's the governor, the governor who has been, I think, a little, she's, she's waiting when the governor of Ohio does something, then she jumps in. Uh, she could have jumped in even sooner. Uh, she's trying to do three weeks, whether three weeks will be enough is a question. I think there's some restaurant, we talked to some restaurant, Michael did, uh, Lucido talked to some restaurant owners uh, on Wednesday, and some are skeptical that it'll only be three weeks. But the fact that Dr. Atlas is in that position, the fact that he tweeted what he did, saying you get what you put up with, is really, it's, it's, it's criminal. It's it is. criminal. Especially it's, considering it's, that those guys wanted to actually assassinate her on video. Right. Um, not even, not even a dog whistle. It's, it's, it's far beyond that idiotic and then he's like oh i never said violence and you know i'm sorry this is mr herd immunity and um you know anybody that's willing to sacrifice one percent of the american population means he's willing to sacrifice over three million people think about that for just a second herd immunity people you're talking millions okay who wants to go next Nancy wants to go next. Mm -hmm. I think everybody, you know, the obvious schmuck of the week would have to be somebody like Monica Palmer, but I'm going to give it to as, as a deep insider, gross point, gross point woods insider. I'm going to give it to her husband, uh, Richard Shetler jr. Who um, used to be on the city council here and was voted out Um, as the board of canvassers uh, meeting was unfolding. um, I was kind of, bouncing around the social media feeds. And on his Facebook, he posted something that read, breaking, this evening, the County Board of Canvassers in Wayne, and this was moments after the vote. Like like a minute after. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the County Board of Canvassers in Wayne County uh, refused to certify the election results. If the state board follows suit, the Republican state legislature will <laughs> select the electors. Huge win for real Donald Trump, okay? Well, it- now that also was accompanied right by there, this is th- these two people share a pillow at night okay this this objection this you know concern over the integrity of the election was not about the you know four votes that didn't balance in 500 you know in 500 precincts wow. it's about it's about a cover story that would have you know like you said keep the shit stirred keep you know keep the uh keep the base fired it's I mean, it's so disingenuous and so dishonest. It's just appalling. Well, to me. And if I can add to that, I mean, there was a statement from Laura Cox, who, of course, is the, no, the GOP she's rep more, here yeah, uh, she's in, in the state of Michigan. That statement was ready before the vote because you don't just put out a statement and write that up in 30 seconds as no. soon as the vote happened. 
So I they was looking was at this coming. thinking they knew it was coming already. Um, yeah. And obviously, but the thing is, though, is that he was wrong, by the way. The legislature can't just do that. That's yeah. not the way Michigan works. He's not um, the brightest shark. Yeah, as as shark Nolan shark Finley shark. pointed out this morning, the goal is to basically get Michigan into the undecided column, get enough states into the undecided column so they can send it to Congress and the congressional delegations get to pick. That's what the goal is. But it's it's really difficult and almost impossible to do. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll um, find out, though. So. Daryl, you got a schmuck of the week? Yeah, I do. Um, I had to think about it because <clears throat> there are a few people I'd like to nominate. But, I, you know, uh, I was I was thinking about, you know, maybe your favorite rappers who have not had anything to say uh, since the election. I was very disappointed in some of them. But I think my smug of the week is uh, Bruce Lavelle. You probably haven't heard of him um, because he's a uh, African-American in Trump's orbit. He is uh, the head of the, uh, uh, the diversity uh, campaign, Trump's executive diversity uh, effort. And uh, he was on the he was on the on the news this week talking about among other things the quote unquote China virus. And you know, <laughs> I just found it very interesting that you know the black man that, that, that Donald Trump tapped to lead his diversity to deliver his diversity message was on national TV talking about the uh, coronavirus in the most racist terms possible. And I think that that tells us a whole lot about Donald Trump. Yep. Uh, not you know he's not well known as most black people who are around Donald Trump are not. Um, but at the same time, he's, you know, he's somebody who I think very much represents the attitude of a lot of African-Americans, particularly, unfortunately, too many African-American men who see in Donald Trump a sort of strength, a sort of um, a, a sort of in, a native intelligence, a sort of craftiness. Uh, and, you know, I think that, you know, black men, we've long sort of prided ourselves on being able to kind of tell a chump from a sucker. Uh, right. from the pool. And, you know, it's very disappointing to see that uh, that uh, Bruce Lavelle's black male BS detector uh, is malfunctioning. So good one. Right. Got it. That's a good that's a good one. I like yeah. that one. OK, Todd, Todd Perkins. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting that if my numbers are right, um, to Daryl's point, is that I think that there are more African-American men that voted for Trump this time than the first time. Um, yeah. That's the statistic that I heard. I mean, it's, you know, to me, you know, those are the ones, you know, I, I, you know, I literally, if, if I know that exists, it really is going to affect my social relationship with people that I might have, you know, I'm just, we are diametrically opposed on so many levels now that it's, and, and I, I hope that it becomes pronounced at least, you know, what's in the dark will be in the light. I like it that way. So, but that my, my schmuck of the week is, Kelly Stafford, you know, she's ah. the representative of what I consider white privilege. She's never picked up a football. She's never done anything. Not to say that being a mother and of four kids is not a huge job, but you know, for you to announce and you to go on and talk about a dictatorship, especially in the incubator that we're in, and we just had a situation in which our governor's life was really imperiled. And so we've got a we got a young lady, you know, like I said, maybe she went to college, but she ain't smart. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, this is somebody who has lived white privilege. I don't know what her background is. I don't care to know what her background is. That's again, maybe I'm closed minded in a lot of ways, but she can't say word one to me. Nothing. You know, I never liked necessarily Stafford anyway, because I think he was a trumped up you know, white guy that the Ford, uh, Ford family chooses and they indoctrinate into their system and they treat them better than they do their black athletes. There's no reason why Barry Sanders had to retire under the Calvin Southern Johnson. It's, the mo it's one of the more racist organizations that I've ever seen. Well, again, I'm, I'm being redundant. I said America's inherently racist. We're in a racist system. So, you know, the Fords are doing just what they do. But again, they do it with the privilege, the idiocracy. You know, there's, you know, it's something who says that they're smart. They just have people around them. They're smart enough to put people around them to continue that organization from going. But, you know, it's something they sit around here and they do what they do. And they, you know, the people the unfortunately, the fans who are so loyal to them, they don't realize these people don't give a darn about you. Nothing. Well, and I'm being nice, Craig. And every, you know, and, and you who own the show, but you know what I want to say. You know what I want to say, but I you feel your game, man. I feel your <laughs> shit. Well, I haven't been on the Lions game since they had, uh, <laughs> had Johnny Best, man. I'm telling you, I, 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 I refuse. I refuse. Don't get me started. We're talking politics. If you really want to get me pissed off, 
Let's talk, talk about the line. Uh, you know, I got to <laughs> say that I, I do like this DeAndre Swift uh, player. He looks like he might have. Uh, he That's might have fine, going on. but I won't see it. And I'm going to pray for a loss <laughs> every week until the Fords sell that team every yeah. week. Yeah, but they never will. Buy. You realize why they'll never sell because it's an asset that creeps growing in value. It's the one thing that the family has got that's stable and is guaranteed <laughs> to make money. Ford Motor Company stock goes up and down, not the lines, man. The NFL just keeps going up and up and up. And well, you I, know, you my know, brother said about Ford. He works for Ford. He says Ford's not in the business of making cars; they're in the business of making money. That's their <laughs> mantra. That that's is that's true. what they say. Corporate America. And, and, you know, it's also corporate socialism. I mean, you know, you can't, you, the NFL is a license to print money. I mean, the Lions, last time the Lions lost money, they went on 16. That's how bad you have to be to actually lose. And money. I think they still net made some because of the sharing with the league. <laughs> but, you know, from the, material, from, the, uh, from the merchandise. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah. God. And, yeah. You know, <laughs> anyway. Uh, all right. So <laughs> I have a nominee for Schmuck of the Week. Uh, it is Geraldo Rivera. Oh, God. Geraldo Rivera <laughs> goes on Fox and Friends. I think it might have been this morning um, and said that if, you know, when the vaccine comes, we should name it after Donald Trump, the Trump vaccine, because we need to acknowledge all the hard work and time oh, he's God. put into battling the coronavirus. <laughs> and wouldn't this be a great way to honor his legacy? And I'm thinking to myself, this is Trump's legacy. But not because of the damn vaccine, Geraldo. <laughs> Jeez, read the freaking room, dude. Come on. You know, it sort you of know, reminds me a little bit of uh, Reagan National when they started pushing the name uh, Washington National after Reagan. And, and some of the Republicans were like, well, we need to name it after a president. And you're like, hello, Washington was the president. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, but here's the thing. You know, there's some people when you see people like Geraldo, when you see people like our president, although Craig, you know, it's almost like when I, I wanted to make Trump the smuck of the week, you can't you can't make the, uh, for Geraldo the Trump of the week. He he's the chump of the week. The Trump and of the been week. the chump of the week since he opened up that vault that was supposed to have all those things from uh, Al Capone. Uh, Al Capone. Yeah. yeah. Capone. But here's the thing. Some of these people and the things they say, I'm speaking for myself. You just want to put hands on them. You just do. You just, you know, I think like my dad said, you know what's the cure for you? A smokehouse whooping. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Where they take you down to the shed and they beat the tar out of you. And then you come back, you know, you're now anointed a good kid. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> From that and point, I went on to college and everything else and the rest is history, you know, but. And with that, I think we're going to have to close down the week that was. Uh, Todd Perkins, your house is in Gross Point. I'm thinking that uh, that's going to be the new clubhouse for Antifa meetings. Deal? Uh, absolutely. You know, oh, so yeah. I, I'm thinking about putting out some some lawn chairs out front. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, I got I already put a basketball rim out there. You know what I'm saying? And I know that was against, you know, the, the tradition. Because, you know, in Gross Point Shorts, you have to have a garage that's set back enough in order to put a, a rim out there. So a lot of people can't put rims. But I, I have that nuance. You know, God bless me with that. So I put a basketball rim out there. And, you know, and and, and God love him. We'll, we'll play basketball in the wintertime, you know. We need to give um... – Todd, a uh, nom de points though, oh, because he can't. You know, I mean, if you're going to be Biff and I'm going to be I'm Muffy, Biff and that chip, but we got like we still got to skip the trip. I like Spike. You know, he's Spike. tough blur. So yeah, Spike. Really yeah. All right, Daryl will be Skip from now on. I'm okay, gonna, or Trip. I like Trip no, better. There we go. Let's do the contrary. Or Trey. You know Trey, what I'm that's the one. <laughs> and you be Ron. You know what I'm saying? Or something. <laughs> hey, hey, Daryl is white enough, man. I'm good. <laughs> well, I was going to check for your park pass before we let you on the show today. So, you know, that's something gross pointers will understand. Brett, Brett Kavanaugh has some cool names of friends. Oh, hey, that's yeah. right. Oh, yeah. Can I be Squee? Squee. <laughs> Squee. Squee Dossie is here. All right. That's it. With that, okay. we've got to wrap it up. And thanks to Daryl Dossie. AKA Squee. We appreciate you being here very much. Todd Perkins, thanks for being here. And again, like I said, the Antifa meeting starts at your house in a half an hour. I'll bring the gene to these, darling. And y'all have a great holiday. I mean, even though we'll be at home, cucumber yeah. sandwiches. Yeah. Yeah. Nancy Derringer, thank you as always for being here. Alan Langle, we appreciate you as yeah, well. Uh, Giving everybody. To Thanks to our friend Michael Lucido for engineering the broadcast today. We certainly do appreciate all the work he puts in for us at Deadline every week. And thanks to Lynette's Shrimp House for sponsoring this program and Deadline Detroit. We appreciate that. And thanks to all of you who watched. 
have a fantastic Thanksgiving. Make the most of it that you can. And Zoom, I realize, is a pain in the butt, but it's better than nothing. So just be safe. Be smart about it. And Alan? Stay home safely. <laughs> My name's M.L. Elric. I'm an investigative reporter and a connoisseur of fine yogurts. I know a little bit about Detroit. I know a little bit about deadlines. And I'm asking you to become a member of DeadlineDetroit.com, like me. I'm not asking you to do anything I wouldn't do. I'm making a monthly donation. My wife is making a monthly donation. I know that seems redundant, but they need the money, and the money goes to a good place. Getting the story out, getting the truth out. Because if we don't support local journalism, there's some people a couple blocks away from here who are going to get away with a whole bunch of stuff that's going to cost you a whole lot more than just a few bucks out of your pocket every month. Go to DeadlineDetroit.com, become a member. You'll see it's really easy at the top of the website. Give early, give often, give generously. Just give a damn. That's the best way I know how. The Craig Fawley Show on Deadline Detroit is made possible in part by Lynette's Shrimp House, located in Highland Park. It's Metro Detroit's premier destination, serving juicy fried shrimp, fish and wings alongside soul food sides and new additions to the menu like turkey tacos and desserts. Located at 13548 Woodward in Highland Park, just north of the Davidson, Lynette's is open for takeaway noon to 8 Tuesday and Thursday, noon to 10 p.m. Friday and Saturday, and noon to 5 p.m. on Sunday. Call now, get some Lynette's.